Hello, this is Mike Paulson with another Bible study video presentation of the risen Savior, Jesus Christ, from my King James 1611 Bible, teaching the simplicity that is in Christ by presenting Paul's greater commission, emphasizing the goodness of God, not the severity of God, the goodness of God during today's dispensation of the grace of God by rightly dividing the word of truth, the King James 1611 Bible, and all according to the Apostle Paul. For you new folks that are out there, here's the verses that support what I just stated to you. Pause and read them again. And if you have read them, it might not hurt you to read them again. That's where I'm coming from, folks. So my personal statement of faith, I look to the inspired, inerrant, preserved, that which is perfect, which came in 1611, the pure words of the living God written in my King James Bible as my only final authority in all matters of faith and practice. I have learned that the moment I put my faith and trust into and onto the risen Savior, Jesus Christ, as revealed to me by Paul, I received the faith of Christ. I instantly was made approved unto God as a new creature, not a new creation, but a new creature. I can now confidently seek ways to please the living God, and not just to please a person or a modern pastor or a religion. My King James Rightly Divided Bible shows me how not to be tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine. So we're moving along here. We're going to look at three little but still big topics. This was part one. It's my attempt at making shorter presentations, folks. I just, uh, even this one, I just wanted to add some more stuff, add some more stuff. I just about added another slide this morning, and I said, no, just stop. Let's just get, let's see if we can just uh, do a, a three, little, three little, but still big topics presentation this morning. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. So these these are short little things, three of them but they're still very important. So that's why we have three little but still big topics. Do any of you folks that have been with me since uh, Tushio, Washington, do you remember my couple sermons I did on the three little pigs? I just thought of that one this morning. I should dig that one up and listen to them. Anyway, we're going to look at scooping and music because I've been talking about music lately, and I thought, well, we can talk about scooping, what's going on there, and bending as well, it's called. Then we're going to just take a few comments on the United States Constitution and the Constitution of Christianity, and to end up with who is and why the Apostle Paul only. So let's just jump into this thing here. We're looking at another musical thought. I've been talking about absolute music here recently, and I mentioned tension and release, and how that is one of the ways that we, so we manipulate it like a barbarian with a controlling power of music. And one of the ways is what they call tension and release. They hit, they hit some dissonant notes, and it doesn't sound good. It causes stress, and then they resolve it to a nice chord or to some nice sounds or whatever. And that goes on all the time in music, and even in uh, absolute music, it's there. Not very much, but it is there, and as time goes on, it increases a little bit, and then Beethoven comes along and uses it a lot as he gets into emotions. And there is some, there is some uh, absolute music that does not have any tension release, and I'll talk about that maybe one of these days or whatever. But let's get back to this. This is what, uh, this is what I call scooping, and I never allowed it in my school choirs. It's just... It's terrible stuff. Before someone sings or plays the actual musical note, they first sing a little lower than the correct note that they want in the melody, and it sounds flat and it sounds off pitch until they quickly move to the correct pitch. So when they want to sing the word, they scoop it. They scoop, I can't even do it this morning. They scoop the note, and they do it all the time. And now today, it's absolutely everywhere. It used to be called saying a wrong note. So that, that's the wrong note. But then quickly they correct it to the correct note. But that wrong, that wrong note creates tension in the ears of the listener. And then it releases that tension by scooping up to the correct note. 
It also meant that you had no talent, because almost anyone could sing if all they had to do was get close to the correct note, and then uh, a few would slide into that correct note, if they could even find the correct note. Someone with skilled musical talent could sing or play the exact note correctly as expected, right on the specific note. Not too low, not too high, just right. Just the correct note from the start. That takes talent. It was all part of the balanced sound in absolute music, and it was on the correct pitch, which for most folks is not easy. That's why we practice in our little bubbles every day. Anything else is an incorrect note and was awful to hear. They simply scooped to the correct note today if they can find it. So we have in vocal music, we have scooping, but in band music, we have bending. We bend the note, and that's basically in jazz and I'll get to that in a second, the big band there. Scooping will never be accepted into the classical European shape with absolute music. It was originally brought into globally accepted popularity by the black spirituals, because while they're out there working, they would get their acts, and they always scoop their, scoop their notes, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, jazz... Is all that's most of what that is is bending, and a good example of that is Rhapsody in Blue by George Gershwin. If everybody's heard an orchestra or somebody play that, starts off with a clarinet and it just bends all the way up. And uh, so you can see, I, I might as well scoop because I can't hit the right notes this morning, but that's called bending. The big band era, swing, Benny Goodman. That, that crowd, they, uh, they bend their notes all the time. And if they're going to sing, then they, they scoop it. Then uh, it worked its way into country music. And they got their instruments now that bend. Got the steel guitar, whang, whang, whang. Uh, their country music, that's their big, that's their big sound, actually. Is they, they're scooping and bending all the time without the heavy-duty rock beat stuff. And now today it's landed permanently in almost every musical genre, genre of music that's out there. Rock music still rejects it, but then rock music is off musically anyway. Scooping is not the problem with rock music. It is the noise of them that sing. That's what that is. That's in uh, Exodus when Moses came down from the mountain there. You can't scoop screaming loud noise. And then today, listen to your church singers. They hold that microphone like they're Frank Sinatra, Perry Como. There's one for you. Uh, like they're on a stage. Well, they are on a stage. The lights spotlight them, and that's what churches have got. One church we visited this year these in this area had 75 spotlights up there. 75 spotlights. It's like you're in Branson at one of the big show houses. And as they, as they sing, they just bend all the time. Scoop and bend. They just go for it. And it continues to be accepted even in the churches. Now, when at one time it wasn't. I totally remember the time when somebody first came along and they tried to scoop their music. And when they were singing, and it happens to be the pastor's wife when I was first in Tushi. And uh, we had a little argument. I said, oh, let's do it the way you want. And then when it was time to sing it, I straightened it out and wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't give her the, the time, whatever, to scoop and do her modern uh, Sandy Patty and... Uh, that crowd out there won't let them do it so it bothers people because you don't have to be a talented person to be able to sing and now everybody does it and uh even those colored and pentecostalated preachers they scoop and bend as they preach and they just put it to you you're going to heaven or you're going to i can't even do it you, you get the point this whole bending and scooping thing uh I guess that's just the day we're living in. But that's also not absolute music. And that's the whole point of this. I mean, you can listen to what you want. All things are lawful if you're truly quickened. Uh, but some things aren't expedient and they don't edify. So we got to have reasons for why we should and why we shouldn't. But if you do, you do. It'll just burn up in your judgment seat. You know, and I used to hear preachers preach that stuff, even though they weren't Paul guys. And I don't know why they would touch on that and not catch on that that's what Paul taught. 
Oh well. So anyway, okay. So there's there's a quick thing about scooping and bending the music. Now let's look at the constitution of true Christianity. We have a battle going on in American politics, which I'm sure we're all aware of that, concerning our constitution. And that constitution contains all of our basic doctrine and laws from our founding fathers. It's under major attack. Kind of has been for a long time, but they're really going for it now. Even the Supreme Court, we've noticed, which is supposed to be able to tell if something is constitutional or not, doesn't seem to always follow the simple constitution anymore. It depends on their political leaning. For many people who are constitutionalists, they still stand at what most people now consider to be an old-fashioned, out-of-date, archaic relic that is hard to understand. I do often wonder, though, how many of those people who stand for the Constitution, as well as those who fight against it, have not really read or studied it. They are just basing their position on little booklets, writings, other people's comments, other leaders, and have any of them ever considered that the enemy could be in our ranks now bashing the Constitution from our own ranks, you know, in order to simply to destroy America, and like Khrushchev said, without firing a shot. In a republic, the design was to choose the right people to guide this country, and if we didn't like them, well, we'd have elections and vote them out if they ever got off the constitutional trail. And so goes the battle of democracy versus republic. We're hearing all the time, got to rescue this democracy. Well, we're not, we're not supposed to be a democracy. Oh, it seems that most people don't even know enough or strong enough to take on the battle, thus saving America through the Constitution that originally designed the United States and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all, seems to be going by the wayside. But then, I, I've been thinking the last couple of weeks, I know I've mentioned it a few times, the King James Bible, that is the Constitution. That is the Constitution of true biblical Christianity. And again, just like our our country's constitution, it still has to be read, studied, believed, and even that has to be rightly divided. I see the churches as states of the United States. They're all run by hired leaders called pastors, who in turn also hire staff and teachers, all who are supposed to follow them obediently. Do you see the correlation? Since our hired church teachers today have been deceived by evil seducing men, they are those who now are deceiving the hearts of the simple unread church members by their good words and fair speeches. Can you imagine the modern left Christians today would bash the traitors of our Constitution while they do the same rejection towards the King James Bible? They do. And when people are uh, who I know are, are against the King James Bible, and yet they're standing strong on the Constitution. I'm getting ready to pop the bubble on that one and say, well, you know what? You're doing the same thing with your King James Bible, with the King James Bible. You don't believe it. You listen to uh, 300 other different versions or make your own choice. Uh, you've got pastors that you follow, and they don't. they hate it. They're trying to get rid of it. Uh, so why can't we do that in America? We're doing the same thing. The Constitution's being destroyed, and the Constitution of Christianity is being taken down. Anyway, there's all sorts of things you can talk about in there, but like I said, these are supposed to be short. So we're going to move on to number three here. Why Paul only? Now, this could take hours, and I've been through this, but this is just a quick run-through of what's the big deal about Paul. He's just another guy. You know, well, he's an apostle, that's true. But uh, let's just do, some quick, do a quick run through here with why Paul only. Who is this guy? Well, as it says in Galatians up there, when contrary wise, and they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, that's Paul, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. For he, he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. So God had a gospel of the, uh, of the, of the, I got to get this right, gospel of the uncircumcision. He had things he had to go teach to the, to the Gentiles, the uncircumcised. And Peter had things that were supposed to go to the Jews, 
to circumcise. The circumcision was under Peter. So why Paul only? Because that's the one God chose to be the um, the leader as such, as the apostle of the apostleship to the uncircumcision. So that's why Paul. Well, I, I get that circumcision, uncircumcision. I probably messed it up in previous presentations. I hope I don't, but you know what I'm saying there. Okay, so let's just keep going here. Wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of me. So Paul says in Corinthians, for yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. Now, one of the things I could do here, but I'm not, we could take each one of these verses, open up your Bible, and look at the verses before, afterwards, maybe at the first part of the chapter. Who is us? Who is we? Who is you? Who is he talking about? Who is he talking to? We know the whole thing is directed to Gentiles, but even breaks that down in some of these places. Um, so, I, you want you have never done that? Then pick a verse, and uh, it's called checking out the context. And check out the context. It's all written to us as Gentiles, but you can get very specific with some of these. And I'm just not going to take the time as much as I want to. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God, given unto me by the effectual working of His power. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk. So as ye have us for an example, and I know very few people that you could mark on YouTube or, or Rumble that are followers of Paul. People will use Paul. People will mention Paul. But they don't follow Paul. And if you follow Paul, you teach about the goodness of God. You, you do the, uh, you, you just follow Paul. They don't follow Paul. They use Paul to build their church. That's what they're doing, whether it be an online church or whatever. Uh, whatever. YouTube could be so irritating in that realm, so confusing to so many people. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. Thessalonians. Acts 9. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And now he does it because that which is perfect came. Now it's done today in modern times, if you want to call it that, through that King James Bible. God gave Jeremiah the words to teach and preach to people in the Old Testament. God gave us the King James Bible through Paul. Those are God's words that tell us what to show to people and tell people. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them. The next Sabbath. Don't get excited about Sabbath. We don't have to have a Sabbath these days. Colossians 2.16 takes care of that. That's the one commandment thing Paul doesn't reiterate and re and still teach, knowing, of course, that the famous Ten Commandments were not given to the Gentiles, they were given to the Jews. But Paul comes along and teaches nine of those commandments in general in his teachings, but not the one about keeping, remember, the Sabbath day. 24-7, Monday through Sunday, Monday through Monday. Anyway, then Paul and Ban then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold, bold, not loud, just bold. The Paul, then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, that's the Jews, but seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, and people that say, well, that's too good to be true. Well, you're saying the same thing. Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldst be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. So Paul's the man of the hour. Barnabas was right there with him. But Paul was the one that met, met the risen Savior on the road. Everybody's got to have a staff, right? And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. Remember, the Gentiles, we're just, we're just heathen. And our flesh that's in us, sin that dwells in us, is as rotten as can be because we are heathen. We're the heathen of the Old Testament. So whatever the heathen did in the Old Testament, we are capable of doing that as a sin that dwelleth in us. 
good thing he made us free, right? It's a good thing he made us dead to the law. Dead to sin, dead to the law. So he made us a new creature. Because if, if we were to go back and just be a new creation, we would have already blown it probably the first day or two of being a new creation. Get baptized again and again and again. Moving along here. Acts 15, and being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenice and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles. And they caused great joy unto all the brethren. This is why Paul, this is what Paul was called to do. And this is what he's been doing. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. And, and we can say that. We should say that. We have a hard time. You know, we have to recognize people, their own worst enemies, opposed themselves and blasphemed. And Paul just kind of shook his raiment and said, well, you know what? Uh, go for it. Your blood be upon your own heads. I'm clean. So he's clean from their blood. But Paul is also clean, even though he probably, looking at Romans chapter 7, he said, when I wanted to do something right, I had thought about doing something wrong, all that battle back and forth. But he's still clean. So Paul, in this reference, is being, I'm clean from your blood, folks. I tried to tell you, and there you go. But uh, when Paul says, I am clean, he really was clean. From henceforth, I will go unto the Gentiles. That's why Paul. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. If you don't recognize this, this is what Paul is telling King Agrippa that uh, Jesus told him. To open their eyes and to, on the road, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. We're not putting our faith in Paul. We're looking to the faith of Jesus Christ. That's the faith that is in Paul. It's the same faith that is in us, the faith of Jesus Christ that we live daily by Galatians chapter 2. But showed first unto them of Damascus and of Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Which is why I think Paul wrote Hebrews because of the things that he, re he was teaching to the Jews. Uh, he was teaching, he, he mentioned those things in the Hebrews. It's a different, he went to the Gentiles of the still a little bit more of a message in there. Paul writes Hebrews. That's why it's put set, set aside for tribulation use. Acts 26 still. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer, and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead, and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. So much stuff to teach and preach in that section there. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Paul was very willing to do whatever he could do to help people see the truth of the risen Savior. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. We're aware of Paul. Paul was made manifest to me through this King James Bible. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. For if I have boasted anything to him of you, I am not ashamed. But as we spake all things to you in truth, even so our boasting, which I made before Titus, is found of truth. So Paul had tough things to say to people. He's sorry that he had to do that, 
but he's not sorry because he had to do that. Does that make sense? But though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, but we have been thoroughly made manifest among you in all things. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest up on me. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. That's Paul. It's the gospel of the uncircumcision. And the gospel of Christ, death, burial, and resurrection. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, and that means according to Paul's teachings, because that's who the mystery was revealed to, which was kept secret since the world began. So read that again. Now to him that is power to establish you according to my gospel, that's Paul, and the preaching of Jesus Christ. Well, everybody preaches Jesus Christ. Was it, is it according to the revelation of the mystery? Is it according to what Paul teaches? Or are you doing Peter's rendition? Or are you making up your own? These verses are simple, but they're very powerful. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, means it's not really a gospel, folks. Uh, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ, which is what they're doing all over on YouTube. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which, which we have unto you, let him be accursed or accursed. That's, that's really an amazing statement. If people are not preaching Paul, they might have something else good to say, good words and fair speeches, but uh, they're, they're, we aren't supposed to give them the time of day. As he said before, so I say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Paul does not teach what the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, early Acts, Hebrews to Jude teach. I've got a long uh, comparison sheet on the website that compares the doctrines, I think 12 of them or 20 of them, uh, that, that's taught in the Matthew, Mark, Luke, John gospel stuff and how Paul teaches it. They are different. You can't mix them both. Unless, of course, you've got your congregation convinced that you know how to, uh, you know, you're anointed, you have the unction of God, so you can tell the difference. Well, that's not true. But even at that, an average reader can't do that. So we stick to what Paul preaches, Romans to Philemon. For do I now persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. That's a tough one, not to serve men. You've got to have a job. You've got to have some money. But in his case, he was not going to... Uh, He's not go out there to please to please men. And I fell into that trap as a pastor a number of times, by the way. I found myself being concerned that people would quit giving or my, my support would go down. Uh, so I found myself uh, teaching nicer things as such. And then I realized, okay, oh, I fell for that trick. But they do that. They do what they're doing to please men. You can't do that. I'm glad Paul didn't. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. So we know the different places where Paul met with the risen Savior. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, that's us, Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. I have heard preachers teach about that little stop, little spot right there, at conferring not with flesh and blood, and they miss the fact that they're supposed to reveal the risen Savior through Paul. To reveal his son in me, I might preach him among the heathen. It's amazing how people miss this stuff. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the affliction of the gospel according to the power of God. Now remember, uh, we everybody's preaches about we're not to be ashamed of the Lord. Well, we're not supposed to be ashamed of Paul either. 
and pastors and people all over the country and world, they're ashamed of Paul. They don't like him. They don't pay any attention to him. They, they just, they don't do it. They always brag about how we love the Lord. Not ashamed to tell people we're saved. Well, why be ashamed that you're telling me follow Paul as a Christian? Because henceforth there is laid for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them that also that love his appearing. We have reasons to, to love his appearing of the Savior because of what he did to us. Paul's getting this crown of righteousness, and we will too if we love his appearing. And by the way, that is the only crown that deals with us as Gentiles. These other guys, they have a whole list of crowns that we can get. Well, for example, look at James. You have the crown of life if you do something right. Well, that means God will kill you if you're not doing something right. And that's what they teach. No, this is our crown. This is the one we can get if we just love his appearing. I'm looking forward to my disappearing. And then when I've disappeared, I will look forward to his appearing. In the best of both worlds there. I want this to be a sudden death here. Okay, let's move it along here. Okay, so now these verses they just read, don't convince someone to stop following their apostolic doctrine and the Great Commission, which is meant to the Jews. Here's a verse that talks about the Great Commission. If you don't know what the Great Commission is, there it is, up in the corner there. And their pastors, media couch preachers, teachers are all teaching to Gentiles today. So they may have a nice little nice little subject on the YouTube sermon, the couch sermon there, or in a church or whatever. Uh, but if they're not uh, preaching the Greater Commission, which is right there, that's in Acts 13.47, then we're supposed to kind of reject those people. Good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Okay, so he te Paul teaches the goodness of God. There it is in Romans 2, 4. So, so this, these verses don't work to convince these people to get off of their church trail and get on with Paul. Then they must not have ever read those verses or did not even listen closely to these that I read today because they're being amused as they're doing something while they listen, sort of kind of hearing. Or three, maybe they have lifted the artist, artistically and scholarly impressive pastor, author, and King James Bible scholar above the King James Bible by his own correcting, as they would call it, of Galatians 2.7, which he says up there at the top of the page, when they saw that the gospel to the uncircumcision, as the gospel to the circumcision was under Peter. So they're taking Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they're taking them to the Gentiles, or they're taking them to the Jews. And that's not what it says. Paul has teaches the gospel of the uncircumcision. Peter was to teach the gospel of the circumcision. It's a huge difference between to and of. But I think, just as I say here, I think many of his followers are even afraid because as soon as they talk, talk about looking to Paul, or they see that I'm looking to Paul, uh, they're, they're afraid. They don't want to get hassled for it. Okay, the big or. Here's the other reason. They have fallen for Jesus' preaching to the apostles just before he was going to depart, when he promised to leave the Holy Ghost with them. Up there, John chapter 14, verse 26. So when Gentiles claim those verses today, they falsely claim, as they are taught by their modern pastor, they are taught an anointing, which is right there. You, you need not that any man teach you, because the Holy Ghost will teach you, which is the way it was in John chapter 14. That is not written to us Gentiles. That false claim of an anointing renders them completely unteachable, because they have no final authority from any Bible, especially the King James Bible. They become their own final authority in all matters of faith and practice. Their religious advice or teachings or whatever it is they're putting on YouTube, it's merely profane and vain babblings. If it's not rightly divided, it's profane and vain babblings, and we are to shun them. I don't know what else I can tell anyone else these days other than according to the Holy Scriptures, and not my opinion, I show scriptures, which really makes them even matter. 
more angry. They are eternally wrong. And I simply figure that they are either still being held captive in Satan's snare because they won't acknowledge the King James Bible as the truth. There's the verses for that. Recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. And God will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. What's the truth? It's the King James Bible. So acknowledge that that King James Bible is the truth. Inspired, preserved, that which is perfect has come, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and God take care of you as you read, which includes a, a, a real uh, salvation, which includes the real operation. And he, he'll make you dead to sin, make you dead to the law. That's why you're a new creature, not a new creation. Otherwise, I think these folks are still captive. So during this dispensation of the grace of God, which is right here in Ephesians chapter 3, that all exposes them as following an unknown God that Paul talks about in Acts 17 on Mars Hill, which really, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, is just another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. That's what's going on. I must say that I've grown to despise all this false yet supposedly magnificent religion, whatever denomination it is, that is found in our churches today, and in the eyes of the deceived, their hearts have been deceived. I despise it. I know what the damage has been. It's damaged me. It's damaged my family. It's damaged everybody else. It's damaged the country because it was the constitution of Christianity. And it's all going down the same path as America. It is only the goodness of God, as taught by Paul, knowing he received it directly from the risen Savior and is found only in the King James Bible that can truly destroy that false magnificence. And that's the end. If you're new to this, these presentations, read this page. It talks about uh, some comments about the King James Bible, about Paul teaching the way of God more perfectly, meaning there's more to it now. And because he's risen, and now we learn about his risen life. Paul teaches a more excellent way. I warn you a little bit here about this unction anointing nonsense and about Great Glory's Jesus Revolution and uh, the Great Awakening of Worship Revival which is nothing but getting everybody ready to uh, worship Satan when he comes down. Don't be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. It's not complicated. It's not difficult. It's not even difficult to do. We just choose to not follow Paul very well because we just kind of, our flesh still wins. Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 7. Moving along. A couple more verses. We still have the goodness of God available. A quick P.S. I should have on the bottom of that of my uh, presentation my no reply checked off, so you can't reply on my uh, website there on the uh, on the YouTube site. But I would still like to hear from you. So email or or give me a phone call. I do get emails occasionally, and that's, I like to hear those questions to help people out if I can. There's the reasons why. I just don't have time or the desire to spend a lot of time on replying to people that don't reply back from the original reply that I replied to. And then up here for your information, in my presentation, you should know that when I mention the word scriptures or the word Bible, I'm referring to a King James 1611 Bible. And obviously, when I mention a King James 1611 Bible, I am referring to the inspired, preserved, written, and that which is perfect has come, Holy Scriptures. And then my final comments, as you listen to or watch any of my sermon study presentations, you're always more than welcome to use your Bible. Any Bible you want, doesn't bother me. However, you will notice right away that your modern Bible does not say or teach the same doctrines that come from a King James Bible. And then when I hear your favorite media men, pastors, couch scholars, bash the King James Bible, and I have for years, and they're getting really strong about it again, uh, bashing the King James Bible and the, the thing that you would listen to Paul, I want to say, listen. They that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. And for those that think they've been scholarly uh, taught about the King James Bible, manuscript evidence does prove the King James Bible. It does have a clean history way back to Antioch, Acts chapter 11, and was never part of the historic line of corrupt Catholic manuscripts. All of the modern Bibles today, including the modern King James Bibles, by the way, 
come from those corrupt Catholic manuscripts that began by a man named Origen in Alexandria, Egypt. Those corrupted and satanic manuscripts went through Jerome, uh, Gerhard Kittel, Hitler was even part of it, uh, West Scott and Hort, those are the two guys to look up. They have a big part in it. And uh, they are the worst God-hating men in their day. Those new manuscripts that you're hearing about were those manuscripts, manuscripts that were just trash in those early days. They're not a big find. They're, they're the ones that were rejected hundreds of years ago. Nothing new. When that Bible says that is that which is perfect means it's finished. It's done. Nothing's going to come later on that King James Bible. And modern Bibles do change major doctrine. They do. Your favorite media men, pastors, and scholars are all part of the Kill Paul conspiracy. The ones I've talked about recently, what the modern Bibles do to music, to sin, to the local church, about the mark of the beast. Now they call it the mark of God. Follow, they teach you to imitate God. That's unbelievable. Uh, grace, they turn it into works, right? The dividing, they ignore it and it becomes profane and vain babblings. Uh, I think it was Colossians 1.14, NIV Bible takes out the blood of Christ there and other places. And they, they take out the promise for God to preserve his words, he said in Psalms 12. Modern Bibles do change doctrine, big ones, big doctrine. And the ye and the yea, and all that is, is plural and singular. Makes it, pins it down much tighter. So, your media men and pastors fit the bill of 2 Timothy 3.13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches, deceive the hearts of the simple. Which is exactly what our politicians have done to Americans was the same thing that the pastors have done to so-called Christians. You need to realize that the King James Bible was fine for over 400 years. It still is, as God promised to preserve his words from this generation forever, a promise that is not in any modern Bible. In fact, it is needed more than ever today, as we're in the latter times, as we are approaching the last days and the time of great tribulation for the whole world, and while the King James Bible will not scratch your itching ears like you would like, it can feed your mind and soul with God's very own inspired and preserved words, and will even show you how easy it is to be instantly approved of God, because he makes you approved, not by your works, but by his. By the way, I am not talking about easy believism, as I've been accused. Ask them about their easy confessionism. If they have to still confess a sin, then it was still imputed to them, thus never forgiven, meaning your Jesus never paid for in the first place. And that's my point. They think we make this easy. Well, Christ had to pay for it. Christ, Christ put that on us because of our faith in him. Your, your Jesus may say, so if you mess up, you better go get it confessed. Then I thought Jesus paid for that. I guess not. Confessionism. Anyway. There you go. The end. The end.